In this tutorial, we'll look at some common questions in the topic of reactivity series. For this chapter, as the name suggests, we need to know the sequence of the metals in the reactivity series, how they were put in that particular sequence by reacting with cold water, steam and acid. And then we need to learn how to apply the reactivity series to predicting or to explaining displacement reactions whether a metal oxide can be reduced by carbon or hydrogen or the different methods of extracting the metal and lastly to explaining the decomposition of the different metal carbonates so as mentioned we need to have an appreciation of how the metals were first arranged in the reactivity series and how they do it is by reacting the metals with a mild reagent first before going on to harsher and harsher reagents. So the mild reagent that we're looking at is cold water followed by steam followed by acid. So to classify the metals, we look at the most mild of reagents first which is cold water. Okay, so the most reactive one the most reactive metal would react with cold water and from the vigor of the reaction we would be able to tell whether it's very reactive or less reactive so since sodium reacts very rapidly with cold water sodium must be the most reactive followed by barium which will also react with cold water and then magnesium reacting slowly with cold water the remaining two metals do not react with cold water means that they are not as reactive as the three that we have highlighted now for copper and nickel um, we to know which one is more reactive now we need to compare the next reagent which is steam so nickel can actually react with steam whereas copper cannot react with steam or cold water under all conditions. That would tell us that copper is the least reactive of the metals followed by nickel. Similarly, we can use the displacement reactions to predict the reactivity of a metal. The concept that we need to recall is this. A more reactive metal can displace a less reactive one from its solution. So to know how reactive a metal is, we just look at whether the metals are able to displace uh, the other metals from its solution. So we will look at the metals one row at a time. For magnesium, you can see that there's a reaction when we put magnesium into the three other salt solutions so that means that magnesium is the most reactive and the least reactive is the one that has no reaction at all so that would be copper and then the remaining two we have iron having reactions with two other solutions and then followed by nickel which has only reaction with one of the solution so for this question and the one before you are not expected to memorize the position of nickel in your reactivity series but to make use of the observations given to predict the position of nickel in this question we now need to arrange the metals in terms of their reactivities based on the reduction with carbon so with that I hope you can remember in the reactivity series we have carbon followed by zinc, aluminium, uh, zinc, iron, lead, copper, silver, gold. Now the reason why carbon is in the reactivity series is to indicate to you that metals below carbon, their oxides can be reduced by carbon to form the metal. So over here, you can see that calcium oxide is not reduced by carbon meaning it is found above carbon meaning it would be the most reactive 
and then for the other three oxides they are all reduced by carbon but at different conditions and the concept that we need to recall is this that the more reactive the metal the more stable is the metal oxide and the harder it is for the metal oxide to be reduced by carbon so if we look at the ease of reduction observations silver oxide being reduced by heating without carbon so it means that it is the least reactive and then for titanium oxide is reduced but at a higher temperature than iron so it must be more reactive than iron in the chapter of reactivity series we also learn about rusting so the key thing to know about rust is that it is dehydrated iron 3 oxide and meaning for the formation of rust you need two things you need oxygen and you need water in the absence of any of the two rusting is not likely to occur next if we look at the four setups very obvious a is the one that has both present for b calcium chloride is actually a drying agent so it will remove any water present for c when we boil water we are essentially removing oxygen from the water so the water would now have no oxygen rusting doesn't occur for d even though your water is not boiled meaning you have both oxygen and water present grease means that there's a layer of oil and we have learned in the protection of iron against rusting that oil would act as a protective barrier to prevent oxygen and water from coming in contact with uh, the iron nail so as we have seen earlier in the topic of rusting we also need to know the three different methods to protect iron from rusting one of which is a protective barrier the second one would be alloying and the last one would be your sacrificial protection so how sacrificial protection works is by attaching a more reactive metal to iron so in the presence of oxygen and moisture your more reactive metal will corrode will be oxidized will react in place of your iron so in this case zinc is more reactive than iron so it will corrode or it will react in place of iron so this kind of protection is called sacrificial protection now a very common question in this part of the chapter is the extraction of iron in the blast furnace however this is no longer in syllabus so the reason why it is appearing in this video is that whenever you see this a diagram that looks like this whenever you see keywords like hematite blast furnace to recognize that it's no longer in syllabus and you can skip such questions